In this lecture, we will talk about protein misfolding diseases. You can see here the appropriate notes, notes on the Voigt and Voigt textbook, but the predominant focus will be on these PowerPoint notes. So the structure function paradigm as a review basically tells us that um, in order to have a successful function of a protein, it needs to fold into its correct three-dimensional structure. And in order for a protein to have a well-resolved three-dimensional structure, for that to happen, that protein must perform its proper function in the cell. So if either of these two structure or function attributes get uh, broken or dissolved, that is when disease begins to manifest itself. Also, as a review, we talked about in our previous lectures how uh, all of the information that is needed for a protein to acquire its proper three-dimensional structure is really contained in the primary amino acid sequence. Uh, we learned that from the Anfinsen experiment, where Christian Anfinsen denatured RNAs A, and once he removed the denaturants, uh, he was able to have RNAs A achieve its proper three-dimensional fold, uh, including uh, the correct disulfide bonded arrangements. So the primary amino acid sequence, for example, for this protein, carbonic anhydrase, has the program and the blueprint to contain and program all of the tertiary structure of the protein. Henceforth, that's the main finding of the Anfinsen experiment. Uh, we further know that uh, the Leventhal paradox does not really occur, thankfully, inside the cell uh, because this folding from primary to uh, secondary and eventually uh, tertiary final native three-dimensional structure happens very fast, whereas the Leventhal paradox essentially states that for a protein to sort of experience and go through all of the proper dihedral angles, disulfide bonded arrangements, and try out essentially all conformations available to it uh, based on protein folding rules, every conformation that it can potentially try out before it lands on one. Now that time takes several centuries, maybe even more than several centuries. So that's the paradox. Uh, but that paradox does not happen because we do know that proteins fold and they fold fast. One of the ways to actually explain out the Leventhal paradox is by thinking about this in terms of three to, uh, thermodynamics, and that is you have a folding funnel. So the thermodynamics of the energy is a little bit different than, we, uh, than typically for any other reaction that occurs in a cell. Uh, going from a um, non-native to a native protein, uh, really uh, is going through energy bumps and barriers until you eventually and exponentially get down to a lower and lower and lower energy state. So those are things that help explain the structure function paradigm. Another thing that the cell dedicates itself to is a tremendous number of chaperones that exists. One of them inside the cell are proteins that actually help other proteins achieve their native state by finding the correct disulfide bond arrangements. Um, we have a whole family of heat shock proteins that assist proteins that will denature, especially under high thermal stress. We also have uh, huge, huge uh, protein complexes known as the proteasome, which allow a sequestered, isolated environment, sort of like a womb for a protein that is misfolded to experiment and get away from the macromolecular crowded environment and fold properly. So this is a very ATP dependent process. However, the ATP and energy that is utilized will be worth it if you get the folded protein out. So despite all of this, you would think every protein in the cell is fully following and complying with the structure function paradigm. Turns out it's not. Uh, we have chaperones, we have uh, a unique way of folding with the folding funnel. We have the uh, primary sequence dictating the tertiary structure. Despite all of that, uh, proteins still misfold, even despite having chaperones. Uh, proteins still misfold, and that is the in essence, the subject of today's lecture. Uh, just touching down on some proteins, very uh, famous diseases that we have all heard of that result from proteins that just uh, escape these numerous mechanisms to allow to properly fold. 
So a lot of these diseases we have heard uh, from just basically living life experience, such as Alzheimer's disease and myotropic lateral sclerosis. So we're looking at these from a term in terms of a protein that has not achieved its three-dimensional fold. And a lot of these proteins, what essentially happens is that they have aggregated. So when a protein misfolds, uh, it's one thing it doesn't perform its proper function. It's even worse when it starts to aggregate. And when it aggregates, uh, that's when we tend to see a lot of the pathology. So um, you should make a note that each of these diseases can cover an entire PowerPoint. And each of these diseases can really uh, cover an entire lecture and an entire course, actually. Uh, so we're only going to dedicate one or two at the most three slides to each of these diseases, which have had years and years and decades of research and input poured into them. So it's very superficial. Uh, the underlying theme that I want you to gain from this is that all of these diseases, in one way or form or another, uh, involving a protein that is misfolded. So these are the topics that we will uncover, uh, uncover and sort of touch upon very briefly. So first of all, one of the first diseases that result from a protein that's folding and aggregating is Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a disease that you do not get diagnosed with while you are alive. Uh, the most definitive diagnosis comes um, during pathology, during autopsy, where uh, they do histology on brain slices and see under the microscope, under stain, um, sort of agglomerations of these plaques uh, inside the cross sections of these brain slices, mostly targeting the hippocampus, which is the memory center of the brain. These plaques turn out to be very rich in beta structure, the secondary structure, uh, beta pleated sheets that somehow form the scaffold for aggregation to occur. So Alzheimer's disease and the pathology and it's very different uh, in terms of protein folding than actually living with the disease. So, um, yes, we could talk about the beta aggregation plaque, uh, but what is happening to a person's life or what is happening to the caregivers or the family, uh, that's really well depicted in this novel, Still Alice, which was actually made in a movie. And uh, the memory loss that occurs and the loss of function that occurs by these um, amyloid plaques um, is very apparent. So this is a story about a college professor in a big Ivy League school who documents, I believe it's her mother uh, who has been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. So she places notes all over the home, um, places notes on the refrigerator, goes upstairs, goes downstairs, immediately forgot why she went upstairs. Uh, so the sort of degeneration uh, of a person's memory, cognition, uh, thinking capacity begins to manifest itself as these aggregates of amyloid begin to um, aggregate and aggregate and aggregate. And eventually they precipitate out of the brain. And again, the central focus of the pathologies in the hippocampus. So uh, you can check out that video, or that movie, um, which is apparently out on video, and the book, which really details the human aspect of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, from the biochemical aspect of Alzheimer's disease, um, the main culprit is this 40-amino acid peptide. Now, some literature actually mentions this uh, peptide being 42 amino acids. So you could be 40 amino acid peptide or the 42 amino acid peptide. This gets cut. And somehow when it gets cut, it uh, sort of goes into the cytoplasm of the cell. And for some reason or the other, it begins to um, fold. And when it folds, it, it adapts this um, beta sheet rich structure. So a lot of these aggregation diseases, very, very typical for Alzheimer's disease, is beta rich um, so here you have two structures that I found on the PDB, protein data bank. So this was the NMR structure of this 40 mer uh, It's alpha helical. Uh, structure was done in solvent that contains fluorine. Uh, this is probably the one that is most clinical and has been isolated from these plaques when they deduce 
the secondary structure. And it's just um, strands and strands of beta that sort of form a nucleating seed upon which aggregation occurs. So um, there's actually been a tremendous amount of literature that focuses on you know, well, how does this happen? You know, why are these aggregates forming and forming? Uh, one paper that actually is about 20 years old or so focuses on the two phenylalanines that are right at the center. Uh, one paper um, uh, published in Nature uh, mentions that these diphenylalanines actually form a seed upon which uh, stacking occurs. And beta, uh, so this forms a beta sheet, and then through that phenylalanine, the phenylalanine through pi pi stacking will aggregate with another beta strand, beta sheet, excuse me, which in turn will aggregate with another beta sheet, which in turn will aggregate with another beta sheet. So you need the seeding. Uh, it could be propagated by the diphenylalanine. Remembering the structure of phenylalanine, we know it's one of the more hydrophobic amino acids. It's very bulky, and it's more prone to the aromatic ring of pi pi stacking. So once these uh, aggregates begin to form, uh, they get a uh, precipitate out of the cell, and they form these plaques, a very beta sheet enriched. Um, so here's the 40 tumor. This is the primary amino acid sequence. Um, and the tertiary, the secondary structure is more beta sheet. So um, the aggregation occurs um, as a result of just being this peptide being leaked out of the cell. So a lot of controversy, a lot of questions. Um, one hypothesis, and there's many, one hypothesis says that, well, it's not the beta plaques that are causing the symptoms in Alzheimer's disease, but it is more the cell's reaction. So something is wrong when the 40 tumor gets leaked out, the uh, amyloid beta gets leaked out. So the cell begins to panic, and as a result of panicking, it begins to aggravate these. So the question that, that sort of many scientists ask are, are the aggregation plaques causing the disease, or are they a result of the cell sort of sequestering a toxic amyloid peptide that is soluble and sort of getting it away? And it is actually the soluble amyloid beta oligomer that is toxic and not the aggregated plaques. Or it could be vice versa, that the pathology is being caused by these plaques, or the pathology is being caused by the amyloid beta 40 or 40 tumor, and the cell is responding to that uh, toxicity by aggregation. So nobody knows the chicken or the egg question, what's causing the uh, symptomatology, but we do know that these people diagnosed post-mortem uh, through histology of the brain have these plaques, which um, are very, very enriched in beta sheet structure. Here you can see the amyloid precursor protein. It's actually a membrane brown protein, and then it gets cut by some proteases in the cell. And once this enters into the cytoplasm, a whole host of signaling occurs, um, which leads to um, these aggregated plaques that we see post-mortem. Um, what's very interesting about the amyloid peptide and Alzheimer's disease is that it's not just the 40 mer and the 42 mer primary amino acid structure was shown in the previous slide. Um, you can get any proteins, even common insulin, even lysozyme, fibrin, uh, proteins bound with actin, such as tau, uh, you can get those to aggregate as well into amyloids. And um, so there's a whole class of proteins known as the amyloidogenic peptides. Just like the amyloid 40 or the amyloid 40 tumor, uh, these can also have the very same properties of an amyloid plaque. So what are those properties? Uh, all amyloidogenic proteins have extensive beta sheet structure. They form, uh, they stain with Congo red, and they actually split blue-red wavelengths of light. That's called blue-red by refringence. So if they have these three properties, they're kind of dubbed amyloidogenic. Beta sheet structure, stain with Congo red, and blue-red by refringence. That being said, you can get any protein in the cell, which is kind of the scary part of this, not just the amyloid, uh, but you can get any uh, protein 
to actually, under the right conditions of temperature, pH, or just misfolding mishaps, to become amyloidogenic and form these plaques. So that's a pretty folding problem uh, that's kind of worrisome because it, there's a lab out there in Cambridge, uh, protein folding scientist by the name of Chris Dobson, who actually was able to get insulin to form amyloid plaques and was actually able to get lysozyme to form amyloid plaques. Under the right conditions, uh, you can get anything to form amyloid. Uh, again, what are the three properties of amyloid? Uh, beta sheet structure, Congo red staining, and blue red birefringence. Our next disease uh, related to protein unfolding is Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease um, is typified by what are known as these Lewy bodies. And the part of the brain uh, that Parkinson's disease really affects uh, is a region of the brain known as the substantia nigra, uh, which is involved in movement. So Parkinson's patients generally have these tremors or these Parkinson tics. Now, from a protein folding standpoint, the culprit here is alpha-synuclein. And this is the protein that it aggregates. Now, it also has extensive beta structure, um, but uh, there could be some alpha also that is involved. So alpha-synuclein, whose structure and one form of the structure shown here, actually aggregates and forms these Lewy bodies. Nobody knows how, nobody knows why, and um, what precipitates this. Uh, definitely there could be a genetic predisposition, as with all these neurodegenerative diseases. But again, the focus of this lecture is mostly looking at the protein, and somehow it has misfolded, and even more, somehow it is aggregated. In, in Alzheimer's disease, we see the plaques. In Parkinson's disease, we see these aggregations in these Lewy bodies. The third disease is Huntington's disease. This is a disease that does have a genetic predisposition. It uh, belongs to a class of diseases known as the trinucleotide repeat diseases. So at the genetic level, um, these proteins have a mutation, and that mutation is an insert of these three um, DNA bases. Okay, so it's actually an insertion of a codon, CAG, that repeats itself many, 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 many times in the DNA sequence, and that gets encoded into the primary amino acid sequence. And that result is that you get a stretch of glutamines. The CAG encodes for glutamine according to the genetic code. So a lot of these are also known as the poly-Q diseases because now you have a stretch of glutamines, poly-Q tract, and the proteins amino acid sequence, which translates to a misfolded protein in the tertiary sequence. So anywhere up to 10 to 35 glutamines can be found. And um, this results in striatum, an aggregation in the striatum of the brain. The brain doesn't know what to do with it, so the cell does what it knows best, and that is to sort of sequester it into Lewy bodies in Parkinson's disease or inclusion bodies in Huntington's disease. So here we see a one version of the protein Huntington, which is the gene that encodes for the protein. A lot of motor defects. Um, what I've done here is I've rendered some of the glutamines. You can see all the red glutamines. Uh, there's a long stretch of glutamines that could serve an anchoring point for this protein to aggregate. So Huntington actually seems in this uh, 3D structure that was solved um, that I got from the PDB, uh, it seems like uh, there's some alpha helical aggregation going on here. But um, I also want to make the point that yes, it can be alpha helical, but the main player in these a lot of these aggregation diseases is um, beta sheet. Our next protein folding disease is, um, is very recent, and that is called the prion protein. So this is very scary because um, what this originally happened, or the original etiology of the disease, prion disease, people didn't know it back then, in the 1600s and 1700s, uh, came from sheep. And they were actually exhibiting very strange behavior um, in Britain and these parts of Europe, these sheep were displaying very odd behaviors. One of the odd behaviors that these sheep were doing was they were scratching themselves almost to the point of death. They were scratching their heads, they were scratching their feet, they were, had this insatiable itch, and it was almost psychotic and neurotic the way these sheep 
or uh, scratching themselves to the point where they would scrape off their skin and blood and tissue would come off. Um, so sheep were being bred and they were being breeded and they were doing some um, inbreeding of sheep there. So they were taking the offspring of sheep and mating it with um, the parents, sort of an incest, uh, in the hopes of selecting for sheep that were uh, very meaty or had you know good genetic qualities, mostly fur and mostly meat. And um, it was later found out that a lot of these sheep were having a lot of these pathologies. So that was, they didn't know it was prion disease. Um, then there's another disease known as Crutzfeld-Jacobs disease, also known as CJD. Uh, this is also a slow neurodegenerative disease, which was very fatal. The average lifespan was about one year or so. That affects one in a million or so people. Another neurodegenerative disease, but most individuals and scientists at that time thought that CJD was really caused by viruses. It was called like a slow virus disease. And our third story has to do with mad cow disease, uh, which involved a series of cows that were also exhibiting some very strange and awkward behavior. So these cows were being fed other cow parts. And so these cows were basically being fed other cows as part of their mulch and feed. And then there's a fourth story behind this before this gets uncovered, and that has to do with uh, tribes. So there's a tribe in New Guinea. It's called the Foray tribe that practiced cannibalism. So sheep from the 1600s, 1700s, uh, people who are suffering from neurodegenerative disease, CJD, um, cows that were behaving awkwardly, uh, that were being fed other cow parts as part of their feed, uh, cannibalism in a tribe in New Guinea. Um, all of them sort of came across a central focus of, of a disease where people were behaving irrational and erratic. And it wasn't a virus. Uh, it wasn't a bacterial agent, it was actually a protein, and that protein was named prion. So this is one of the more recent protein misfolding diseases. Prion stands for infectious protein. And this is a protein that is well within us, well within all of our cells, but somehow it has turned infectious. So here you see uh, prion protein sort of studded uh, across um, the cell, uh, in these gold, uh, excuse me, in these black dots. These black dots are actually uh, antibodies labeled with gold um, taken with an electron microscope. So prion proteins, as stated before, are infectious proteins. And the idea is that you have a normal cellular protein. So we can call this a normal cellular protein. For some reason or the other, it misfolds. And when it misfolds, it forms into this conformation known as scraping. Now, the scary thing about the scrapie is that the scrapie form actually binds to the cellular form, the normal fold of prion protein, and converts it to more scrapie. So as you can see in this diagram, it, it's sort of like a domino effect. So all you need is one misfolded protein, and that misfolded protein becomes scrapie. The scrapie converts the normal cellular folded prion protein into more scrapie. So now you have one scrapie in red converting all the normal prion proteins into the misfolded scrapie proteins. What happens? They aggregate the scrapie protein, the fold of prion protein known as scrapie aggregates, uh, kind of have those same amyloid properties, um, beta enriched, um, uh, combo red staining, blue red birefringence, kind of the same old properties that we saw and the amyloid plaques. So your textbook actually has a structure, uh, the NMR structure of human prion protein. Again, this is found in all humans. I really do not know what the function of the native protein is in the cell, uh, but we do know that um, for some reason, this rather normal looking protein would have some function in the cell, misfolds, this would be the scrapie form, and that this misfolded for protein converts all the normal folded protein into the misfolded scrapie function. So uh, the CJD disease and the mad cow disease and the sheep from the 1600s, 1700s that were in, that they were inbreeding the sheep farmers, um, and also the cannibalistic tribes in New Guinea. 
Um, it was not a virus. It was not a bacteria. That was the etiology or the cause of the infection and their neurodegeneration. It was actually a native protein that has been converted to a misfolded protein that aggregated. So this was happening in the brain, and it was eliciting these very strange, awkward, and dangerous behaviors. So if you want more information on prion proteins, which is a very fascinating uh, disease, fascinating in the sense that, once again, it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, it's our very own proteins that have turned against us in a misfolding cascade that has led to neurodegenerative disaster. Uh, prion proteins also cause another terrible disease. This is called fatal familial insomnia. So CJD, mad cow disease, uh, cannibalism in some tribes, uh, and this one, FFI, fatal familial insomnia. Uh, if you're interested in a, a recreational book, uh, this is a science book that details a family in Venetia, Venetia or Venice, Italy, uh, that couldn't sleep. So generations upon generations and generations of family that suffered from insomnia, they would go nine to ten days without sleeping, and they would start hallucinating, and, and uh, they would exhibit all these erratic behaviors, the same erratic behaviors that a lot of CJD and um, mad cow um, disease elicits. Uh, but this time, the problem was they suffered from insomnia. So this was discovered in 1982, uh, but finally, the person who discovered it and who made that hypothesis, who posited, posited that it was proteins that were causing the disease, was Stanley Prusner. He's at San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco. So um, I took a quote from his Nobel Prize speech, and one of the things he said was, as I read this out, I was surprised to learn that she, referring to a patient, uh, was dying of a slow virus infection known as kutzfeld jacob disease, which evoked no response from the body's defenses. So usually viruses would elicit a host immune response. Next, I learned that scientists weren't sure if a virus was really the cause of CJD, since the cause of infectious agent had some unusual properties. The amazing properties of the presumed cause presumed causative slow virus captivated my imagination, and I began to think that the defining molecular structure of this elusive agent might be a wonderful research project. The more that I read about CJD and the seemingly related diseases, Kuru of the foreign people of New Guinea and Scrapey of sheep, the more captivated I became. Reading that a little bit later in his speech, I had anticipated that the purified Scrapey agent would turn out to be a small virus, and was puzzled when the data kept telling me that our preparations contained protein, but not nucleic acid. So prion protein is a misfolded protein that has turned infectious. One of the more freakiest uh, proteins in our cells, 50 to 100,000 cells in our body, this protein is probably, at least in my mind, the most scariest. All right, finally, we will end our topic of uh, misfolded proteins, and it's an Important the why a protein should be folded properly and achieve its native three-dimensional structure. That's the point I've been harping on. Uh, was uh, is uh, the disease ALS, a myel myotrophic lateral sclerosis. The so normal function of this protein is to actually detoxify free radicals. During normal cellular metabolism, oxygen can form a radical, and that's called a superoxide anion. Uh, well, superoxide dismutase detoxifies that into uh, hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. This hydrogen peroxide can further be detoxified by other proteinaceous enzymes in the cell. So this is basically a way to make the cell safe and keep it oh, keep cells um, away from escaping the damages of free radicals. So. Without enzymes and proteins such as SOD, uh, superoxide radicals, which are very, very reactive, can actually find ways to achieve a stable electron pair. And to achieve a stable electron pair, it will react with anything. The problem is it will react with neuronal tissue membrane. It will react with your DNA. It will react with anything unless it's detoxified by this enzyme. So that's the utility of superoxide dismutase. That's its overall function. People who do not have this properly folded
Uh, and there's a whole list, a whole library of mutations from myotropic lateral sclerosis. There's mutations that result in the copper and zinc being unable to bind to its proper sites within the three-dimensional structure of the enzyme. So if the copper and zinc, which are required for the enzyme's mechanism and function, aren't held on tightly in the protein, that's a version of, SO, of ALS. If uh, the amino acid is replaced, that's another version of ALS. So a whole library and litany of mutations found in copper zinc superoxide dismutase found in ALS as a result of mutations in SOD1 sort of found or sort of cataloged in this website here. Um, the most common mutations are changing an alanine at position 4 to a valine. So that seems to be a very subtle change. However, that is a mutation that is linked to ALS. Another one is a probably a little bit more dangerous just by looking at structure alone. A glycine at position number 37 uh, is replaced by an arginine. So two very, very different amino acid structures probably are the ones that um, change the overall three-dimensional topology of the enzyme. Superoxide dismutase is a dimer, and it's related by 180-degree two-fold symmetry. So all you need to do is take this subunit, rotate it 180 degrees, and now you have your dimer, the fully functional form of the enzyme. So protein misfolding and ALS, along with the protein culprit, SOD, what's going on here? So I'll read to you this segment from this uh, journal from PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, Alumerization versus oxidative damage. So uh, harkening, harkening back to the amyloid plaque or Parkinson's disease or Huntington disease, uh, we were talking about aggregation. So protein misfolding. Uh, seems to invite aggregation. The cell panics and doesn't know what to do. A lot of times it just sequesters it into some sort of inclusion body. So reading this from this uh, journal article, uh, two hypotheses have dominated recent discussion of the toxicity of ALS, mutant copper zinc SOD proteins, the oligomerization hypothesis and the oxidative damage hypothesis. So the oligomerization hypothesis maintains that one, the mutant copper zinc superoxide dismutase proteins are or become misfolded and consequently oligomerized into increasingly high molecular weight species that ultimately aggregate and end up in proteinaceous inclusions. So that's probably a theme in a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases, um, regardless of ALS to Alzheimer's disease. Number two, uh, the oligomer oligomerized or aggregated proteins are at some stage in their formation selectively toxic to motor neurons. A variation of the oligomerization hypothesis is that mutant copper zinc SOD aggregates bind to the other essential proteins such as heat shock proteins or mitochondrial electron transport proteins, making them unavailable to perform their normal function of the cell. So these copper zinc SOD aggregates are resulting in pathology, and if it's in neuronal tissue, uh, you can see the pathology can be very apparent. A lot of people who have ALS are confined to wheelchairs. They have no motor movement. They also have speech impediments, uh, but mostly this is a uh, motor neuronal disease where individuals uh, just seemingly cannot move. They're rendered paralyzed. This is looking at it not from a clinical standpoint, not looking at it from a physiological standpoint. We're looking at these diseases from a structural biology, protein misfolding standpoint, with the theme of the structure function paradigm um, at the central focus here. The idea is that structure predic is predicated on function, function is predicated on structure. When these two do not uh, when these two do not collaborate with one another and protein misfolds, it leads to a cascading effect. Lots of diseases, this is just a small sampling of neurodegenerative diseases that occur. There's a lot of other diseases that also occur when a protein misfolds.